Here's some of the things dads say all the time. Do you think I'm made out of money? Money, money doesn't grow on when I was your age, right, you hear that, then you know the lecture's coming, right? I'm not sleeping, I'm just resting my eyes, all right? While I'm sitting there watching TV, they accuse me of sleeping, I'm just resting my eyes. I'm not going to tell you one more time, another phrase they say. They walk in their, their room and say, were you raised in a barn? barn. Yeah, okay, moms are in on that one too. Uh, don't talk back to your mother in this case because it would be a dad but you're right your elders if uh, you were told to jump off a cliff would you jump off a cliff right that's the one dads use stop your crying i'll give you something to okay see there uh, these are clutch phrases that i'm empowering you as fathers with um, then when they come and they ask you a question you say go ask your yeah that's a great deflection uh, waste not and Want not right. And uh, you'll understand it when you get older. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's, I'll give this to all you men before you leave today. So you'll have these clutch phrases to help you be the father that, uh, that you want to be or need to be. The truth is, it's not quite that easy to be a father, is it? Uh, it can be the, it's the most amazing job you'll ever have, and it's the most difficult job you'll ever have. Uh, becoming a father is uh, getting a job that you are underqualified to do. <laughs> have you, uh, you remember the moment that, that you, you went to the hospital, and your wife has this baby, and it's particularly the first one, has this baby, and then they're watching it. The nurse is taking care of it and everything's going good. And then there's that moment where she hands the baby to me and I'm supposed to go home and take care of it for the rest of my life. And I'm looking for an instruction manual. You know what I'm saying? There ain't nothing. If she like, he's yours now. You got to go outside and you got to take care of him. Yeah, I think I'm not prepared. Can he just stay in the hospital next week? I'm just telling you, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Lisa, it was 103 outside. Lisa wrapped him in five blankets as we were taking him the car. It's 105 out. And the nurse is just going, sweetheart, I know you want to protect your baby, but you're going to kill him, okay, because it's 105, and he can't take that many blankets. And so uh, it, it's a difficult job. But, you know, uh, I think a, as you become a father, and, and let me say this this morning, um, Anybody can be a biological father and anybody can be a biological mother. Not uh, everybody is a dad and not everybody is a mom. You can be a father or a dad and you can be a mother to kids and people that God sends your way. You can be a mother and a father to them even though you're not the biological mother and father. Did you know that? God wants you to be a spiritual mother to somebody, to be a spiritual father to somebody, and he will bring people into your life that will ask you and are begging you to be a mother to them, to be a father to them. And so you should pursue that. And even, though, even in that moment, they don't come with instruction manuals, but God says, listen, I've divinely sent them to you. And, and I want to tell you this this morning. I think it's so important to hear this. I remember the day that the Holy Spirit gave this to me when I was talking to some parents. And, and you know yourself, right? And I know myself better than nobody else. And there's this moment where you realize, I got a lot of flaws. I got no business being a parent, right? I don't know. I don't know. It, here's, the, here's what happens in your head. I don't know that I'm the best guy for these kids. These kids deserve somebody better than me as their father. They deserve a better mother. And if you're not careful, those thoughts will begin to haunt you. And here's, here's, here's the good news. I want you to get your arms around that, this this morning. God designed you with strengths and weaknesses. There's some things you're really good at. There's some things you're not so good at. But God said this, in his infinite wisdom, and in seeing eternity, past, present, and future, he sees past, present, and future as a picture on the wall. This is what he decided. The kids I give you 
with your strengths and your many, many weaknesses, you're the best parent that could parent these kids. There's nobody else in this world that could parent them better than you can. Or he wouldn't have given them to you. And you go, but yeah, but man, I got all these problems. Your problems, if managed correctly, will be the greatest help in your parenting skills. Point in fact is, I have three brothers. There are four of us. And all four of us uh, grew up in my home, obviously, with my mother and my father. My mother suffered with uh, insecure feelings her entire life. She struggled with insecurity, inferiority, not thinking much of herself. And guess what happened with that weakness? She decided when I become a parent, the number one thing that will never happen to my kids is that they're going to feel insignificant. They're, I'm going to highly esteem them. And she raised four amazing, sometimes monstrous, stable children. Amen. <laughs> And you know why we're secure in who we are? And we're all completely different. If you've met my three brothers, you know we're not alike. We're all different. But here's what we know. We're different, and my mom said, it's okay to be different. God made you different, and I don't want you like anybody else. You just be you. And that security, that stability springs from the weakness of her childhood and her life experience. You see, your strengths and weaknesses both bode well for your parenting approach to kids. If you're not careful, though, you'll just say, well, I've got all these issues, so I can't be a good parent. You know, you sit down with your kids, and my kids will tell you, my kids know my weaknesses. They'll sit down and laugh about me while I'm in the room, amen? You know, well, we know Dad, you know, he struggles with sharing his feelings, We'll probably have to get a gift card and point out words to him so he can kind of help. And it's funny because, you know, I'm a communicator, right? I communicate for a living. But my kids know my weaknesses. And when I'm uh, fumbling around in my weakness moment, they're kind of chuckling because I've given them permission to do that, right? I say, kids, now you know I love you, right? But you know I got, I got areas I'm just not good at. And so, like, if you want me to write a meaningful card in a poem, man, you're in trouble. I can barely do violet is blue, and see, I ain't messed that up. And roses are red. I, I, I'm just, it's way out of my gift mix. And, and what I've said to them is, uh, I do have these weaknesses. I acknowledge them. And I want you to know, don't ever let my weaknesses tear you down. They're my problem and not yours. You see how powerful that is to just let them go along? And they'll say, Dad, right now you're doing it. You're like in your weakness. You need to stop. And oh, yeah, 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 okay. And, and I've given them permission to do that. And so they, they tell me this is, this is not your best moment. And instead, because if they don't feel that way, here's what happens. They walk away going, my dad doesn't like me. My dad doesn't care about me. My dad's not... He, he doesn't show me the affection the way I wanted to or affirmation the way I wanted. But I know this is his area of weakness, so he's trying the best he can. He's just not that good at it. What does that say? It says, my heart wants to do it right. It's just that I'm working on my weaknesses, and I need you kids to be patient with me. And that means the kid goes away going, you know, my dad really loves me. He's just not really good at showing it. You know, my dad used to go around, and he had all these clutch phrases. You know, I wouldn't take you boys to a worm wrestle, even if you had a chance to win. You know, and then my mom would slap him on the back of the head, Mrs. Security, slap him on the back of the head. Don't talk to the boys like that. That's not, you're just supposed to speak life, not death over them. I said, you go mom. And so then my mom would get us aside because my dad grew up in a completely dysfunctional home. His, his dad was just a drunk and a wino, and, and he didn't even know him, really, for, for many years. So he, he, was, he didn't have a role model. But my mom would come and say, so let's talk about your dad. Let me explain to you. He loves you more than life itself. You may not hear it very often because he struggles. And I'm going to work on him, and we're going to teach him how to be a good father uh, together. But you kids need to not take it personally. See, my mom had this way of going around the back door and helping my dad with his weaknesses and, and vice versa. And so God says to you, 
And, and to me, it's okay to not be a perfect mom and a perfect dad. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make big ones. The only question will be is how you handle them. If you go up and say, you know, I need you to forgive me. I need you to forgive me. I choked. I need you to forgive me. This has nothing to do with you, and it has everything to do with me. And in that moment, I've taught them a life lesson. You see, lessons of more is caught than taught. You might write that down. More is caught than taught. You can, you know, just do as I say, not as I do. You ever heard a dad say that? Come on, does that really work? Do as I say, don't do as I do. No, if you really believe it, you'll do it, right? So more is caught than taught. You, you watch people around you and you catch what they're doing. Actions speak louder than words. There's a verse in the Bible, it's in Deuteronomy, I'm going to pull it up here, and it's verses 1 through 6, and God is talking about fathers and mothers, and he's talking about generational problems or generational blessings continuing to your kids, your grandkids, and on and on. Now, my dad and my four uncles, he was a brother of five. All my uncles died young. They all died alcoholics and drug addicts, and it ate their life up. They followed suit after their father. And my dad decided that he was going to stop that, that that wouldn't go to my generation. Amen? It takes, a, it takes an amazing man to do that. He said, I'm going to go to church regularly. I'm going to ask for God's help, and I'm going to turn this thing around. And my dad began to go to church and raised us in church, and things shifted because he made the choice, even though he had a difficult childhood. This verse says that you and I, as fathers and mothers, are to do life together. Do life together. That's where it gets caught and, and not just taught. You don't come home and say, kids, go in your room and read your books and study, and oh yeah, everything about life, go ask your mother or something. You know, we're supposed to do life together. What does that mean? That means when you're watching TV, you're going, kids, now listen, this is the Disney Channel, but that boy should not be going over to that girl's house and being in that girl's house without her mom and dad being home. I mean, they're only eight and nine. That's not good. You know, in that moment, I'm watching a Disney movie with them, and I'm telling them this is what our family stands for, what we value, and this is how we live, and we don't live that way. Okay? That doesn't mean they can't watch any Dis every Disney show. It just means that I use that as a life lesson, right? The Bible talks about, it says this, God was talking, he says, these are the commands and decrees of the law of the Lord. Your God uh, directed me to teach you, to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So that you and your children and their children, you, you see that phrase there? Your children and their children, after them may fear the Lord your God or honor him. Not be afraid of him, but, but be honor him for who he is. Honor the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees, his commands that I give you. And so that you may what? So that you may enjoy it. Not that you'd be a slave, not that you just have to obey God and there's a bunch of religious rules. The, the father, and that's what's happening here, the father is speaking to children. He says, I want you to enjoy a long life. You can have a long life, but you may not enjoy it if you don't do it God's way. Next. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you. Everybody say, well with you? Well with you. If you obey the, and do life the way he says, the way God has asked you to, it will go well with you. We live in a world that lives with relativism, right? relativism and that simply means you know what might be right for you is not right for me and I have my own rightness and you have your own rightness and I, I heard a professor say once he says there is no absolutes you know because we come and we say the the word of God is spoken by God it's an absolute truth an anchor a structure a foundation that if I will live that way and use it and live in obedience to you to it, and it's 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 concrete. It's not abstract. Then life will go well with me. I can trust it, no matter what. It's absolutely will work. God's word will work for you. And ironically, as he said that, uh, one of the students said, "So, are you absolutely sure that there's no absolutes?" <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. You've just given me an absolute about there being no absolutes. 
And, and that's, the, that's the craziness of the world. Well, you know, it's not, there's no absolutes, and whatever's right for you is right for me. You know, and I have my own right system, and you don't have your right system. That's crazy. And, and God says, listen, I want you to have a, a, a blessed life. So be careful so that you, it will go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey. God says, I want to provide for you, the God of your ancestors, and uh, these are the things that I promised you. Next. It says, Hero is the Lord our God is the Lord, uh, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your what? And with all your, and with all your strength. You know, it's one thing, it's one thing to make your kids obey, and it's another thing to have your kid's heart want to obey you. Do you hear me? So it's, I can make my kid obey, you can make a child obey, but but working with their heart so they want to obey and do the right thing is the most important thing. When, when you're loving somebody, you're loving their heart. Their actions don't always represent their heart, do they? Have, have you ever had an action and you've done something and somebody watched you and in your mind you thought, they must think I'm a terrible, horrible person because of what they just saw me do. And in your mind you're thinking, that's not necessarily me. That's, that, that's not my heart to be mean and cruel, although I know it looks that way. And, and God says, you're to manage the heart of your children. And that's hard work. It's, it's, it's not just disciplining. There's so much more to it than that. And then the next verse on there. It says, these commands that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on who? Your children. Your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you're walking along the road or you're driving in your car and you're listening to a song that you think is inappropriate for your child to listen to. When you're hearing news on the radio that you, your kids are going to be fearful about and you're going to reduce the fear because you're going to say, God is going to take care of us regardless of where this world is headed because he's a good, good father. You see, every moment you walk through life is a learning, teachable moment. And that's how you get it into the heart. It's not an education where we swap academic intellectual information. I got to get it in their heart. So then you have to ask a question that goes something like, so how does it make you feel when your dad goes away for a couple weeks because he's got to work? Or how does it make you feel when, you know, you've got a sister that's really, really sick and she gets a lot of attention because she's sick all the time and you're not? See, when you ask that, then you're going to get a heartfelt answer and you now can deal with heart issues rather than just laws and decrees and do's and don'ts. Talk about them when you sit, sit at home, when you're along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as a symbol on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. If you're the spiritual leader of your home, would uh, this be true that your kids and everybody in your family would say, my dad's a spiritual dad, it's tied around his forearm, and each and every day he is talking to me and keeping at the forefront and the center of our family the spiritual welfare of our home. See, that, that, I mean, it's, when I talk about this, it's hard to be a dad, right? I mean, I could tell you all the things I did wrong. I could tell you the things that I should do, did okay, but I should have done much better. I mean, it just goes on and on. And if I'm not careful, I'll get tied down with all that. But, but it's very, very clear that I am supposed to keep the first things first. I'm supposed to keep uh, my, and we're not careful, uh, baseball, gymnastics, a lot of other things in life will become first instead of your relationship with your child and our relationship with our Heavenly Father. That should be the main thing. It should get more attention than anything else. It doesn't mean you can't play sports, but you can do sports. You can do, uh, you know, uh, volleyball. You can do gymnastics. But you have to do it in such a way that you're telling your kids, this is a lot of fun, but this is not first place in our life. This is not the first thing. The first thing is our Heavenly Father. Bind them on your hands and on your forehead. Next. Oh, I believe that's the last verse. So very quickly, I'm going to go Mark 5 because I only have just a couple, couple minutes here. Four things that a father should uh, uh, to make a great father. Number one, 
is you're a protector. Everybody knows that, right? If I ask you what's the number one job, it's protect. How many fathers would lay down their life for their kids? Yeah. How many of you would do it for your wife? You better hold your hand up or I will be talking to you later. Yeah. Uh, how many of you would jump in front of your car for your kids, right? Yeah, we, we would all do that. We would toss them and we would take the hit. There's a lot of things we would do, and I know you do it for baby, right? Because you, I, uh, I, I know he's, he's a father of a dog. How many of you have a dog that you love as much as your children? Okay, good. We're just going to go public here. Um, uh, listen, uh, here's the deal. Uh, sometimes you and I think that being a protector is simply just that. I will lay down my life. We'll take a bullet and we'll, we'll toss him away from the car so we get hit. We'll do that. And that's a one act uh, moment that you would make and that I would make as a father. I'll tell you a more difficult thing to do is to protect them day after day after day from unhealthy relationships. You see, we want to, we, we'll protect them when life is at stake, but sometimes we forget their spiritual life is at stake, right? So every unhealthy relationship in high school and junior high, uh, you should lay down your life and protect them. See, pro you've got to protect their heart, their body, and their soul, right? The body, soul, and spirit. You have to protect those three things, and the heart is the soul. They're one, right? So I have to help them emotionally. Where are you at emotionally? I have to protect your emotional well-being. I have one child that, that struggles with a lot of anxiety. I have another uh, child that doesn't do stress real well, and, and I know that about them. I'm completely aware. I've talked with them about it, and what we do is when I see stress coming in, I protect them from everybody and everything. You're taking off. You're going to stay at home. You're not doing anything. If anybody asks you to do anything, you're not doing it. See, I have to be the protector on multiple levels. Their emotional well-being, their physical well-being. So that's the easy one for fathers. But the spiritual and the emotional sometimes get pushed aside. How are you doing spiritually? Do you ask that question of your kids? We have to protect them. Next. Number two, you have to be a provider. We all know that. You have to provide, and, and it's easy. Uh, groceries, food, you know, water, you're good. Out of here. <laughs> you, you got water this week. You got food. You got shelter. Love you. Bye. You know, you know it's so much more than that, right? You need to provide for them spiritually, right? You need to provide for them emotionally and physically. There, there's a you know, as we, we do all this, uh, you, you may, some of these you go, I'm okay with this, I do good in this. And then you hear some of them go, oh man, I should have done that better. And if you want, if you're not careful, you'll just look to the past of what you didn't do. Forget the past. Forget the past. You know, we got today and tomorrow and the rest of your, our life. And I don't care how old your kids are. There is never a day that you can't call up uh, your 50-year-old son and say, listen, I love you, and he doesn't want to hear it. There's never a day you can't call him and say, how are you doing spiritually? That he, he doesn't want to have that conversation. If he's feeling guilty, he may not want to do it, but he loves the fact my mom, my dad, care about me emotionally, spiritually, and physically how I'm doing. And so we're to continue doing this. You know, all we need to do is say, okay, uh, I, what kind of father can I be from this day forward? And there's going to be a day where God's going to send a young man in your life that you're to mentor, a young lady in your life that you're to be their spiritual father and mother. And I need you to really catch that this morning. You may say, man, I've done it. I'm exhausted. The kids are out of the house. I'm done. <laughs> right? And if they, they want any issues, you know, just send me grandbabies, but I don't want, you know, I'm done. I'm out. I just want the grandbaby. That's an easy duty. And the truth is, is if this is going to pass on to generation to generation, then you're going to have to sit down with your daughter and go, so listen, sweetheart, uh, little Johnny is not doing good at school. Well, no, what makes you say that? Because I'm grandma, and I sit down and talk with him, and he's emotionally not doing well. I'm not talking about academically. He needs some help. You need to sit down, and this is what you need to do, because this is what I did with you. And you need to pray about it together. You need to talk to the teacher. You need to make arrangements in that room so relationally, he isn't being bullied or beat up in, in this class. So you, you're a provider. Next. 
I only got a couple minutes. Prophet. I put prophet and promoter. Let me just say this. The prophet would come in and speak vision and future over your children. Do you do that? It doesn't matter how old your kids are today. I'm, I'm telling you. Do you have conversations as the prophet would? You're to be a prophet over your family to give them a, a vision of the future. All the days of my kids went to school, every day I would uh, kick, kick them out of the car. I would drop them off at school. Let me say, like the good father, I did both. I was a bad father. Uh, get out of the car. Uh, then there was days that said, listen, every, every day they would get, I would drop them off at elementary school. I would say, listen, it's a great day. God's got a great plan for your life. Every day. I, I would say that. And then they'd get sick of me. Yeah, 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 it's a great day. God's got a great plan. Bye, Dad. I got to go. I mean, they just, you know, uh, I would start the first two words. Blah, 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 blah. So this, uh, this week, uh, one of my kids sent me a text and said, Hey, Dad, it's going to be a great day, and God's got a great plan for your life. Oh, oh yeah, you guys are all going to tear out on me. I won't say whether I cried or not. I don't want to talk about it right now because I'm going to get emotional and I have to preach. Amen. Amen. But here's what that phrase says. It says, God has a great plan for your life. You're a child of God. He's concerned about your spiritual well-being, and so am I. And it's going to work. It's going to work. It don't matter what comes our way in school, and work, or whatever. God's going to get us through it because he has a great plan for your life. It also says, don't get sidetracked. You may want to go off and, you know, be an astronaut. And if God wants you to do that, that's great. But if he doesn't, don't get sidetracked. Because God's got a great plan for your life. And it may not include what you think it is. And we need to run it by him. We need to ask him for help in that area. Then lastly, you're, so before I leave that, let me just say this. Did you know the, the prophet of the home that was the father of the home, and you speak blessing or curses over your children, Okay hear me this morning. Uh, there's power in your words. The Bible says, as a man speaks, so is he. It says you can speak life and death. The tongue has the power of life and death. You tell a kid he's worthless, he's no good, uh, he, he won't grow up to be anything, then you're speaking death over that child and you're hurting his future. And then you're forcing a child to try to erase all that garbage and hear the words of the Lord that says, I, I love you, you're fearfully, you're wonderfully made. I've got a great plan for your life. This is going to be great. This is going to be the most exciting life you've ever had. We're going to do it together. And they can't hardly make that jump because the echoing words of a father or a mother who spoke death over them. If you're a prophet in your home, you need to say regularly, you're going to be amazing. You're going to grow up and be an amazing person. You are grown up and you're already amazing, but it's going to even get better. God's just got this great plan for your life. I'm speaking words of life over you. That's the job of the prophet. Then lastly, the priest. You're the priest of your home. The priest would go and make sacrifices to make relationships right. Now, listen, uh, and this one, if we're not careful, moms sometimes step in and do more priestly work than the father does. Okay, the, the father should be the priest of home and he makes sacrifices to make the relationship with God and his children, the God, the father, and the son to make them right. You're to be a priest in your home. You're supposed to be a priest, a prophet, and a servant king, which is totally different than a king. And I know you guys like the king part, but it's a servant king. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. That's a, a servant king. As the priest, you're to make sacrifices to make your relationship with your marriage right. I don't care if you're 99.99% right in the fight you're having with your wife. You're to initiate reconciliation and make a sacrifice and say, honey, in that point, you don't say it like this, but that point zero 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 one part of this problem was me. I'm wrong. I need you to forgive me. Would you please forgive me? When the kids aren't getting along in the house, you're to reconcile make things right. When a parent's struggling with mom, you're to go in there. Moms, when a, a child is, is struggling with dad, you're to go in there and you're to help do the work of a priest and make sacrifices of your, your time. Because here's the problem. If we're not careful, you realize everything I've described to you requires an enormous amount of time. And that's where the problem really is. Listen, I'm working 60 hours a week. 
I brought home the bacon, you cook it and take care of those kids. Don't they know I love them because this, this is all the money I made for them. And as long as I'm providing, they got food, shelter, and water, I'm done. I'm out. Oh, man, that, that, you can do that till you die, and you'll be estranged in your relationship with your children. God says there's so much more to that. But listen, you know that this morning. And here's what I do know. Most of us uh, ten, have a tendency as fathers to beat ourselves up for what we did wrong in the past. Listen, listen God says, I knew you were going to make a bunch of mistakes. I gave those kids to you anyways. Because yeah. you're my son. And it's going to be a great day. And I've got a great plan for your life. Yeah, I'm 60 years old, 70 years old, and I'm a father still. Yeah, and 71 is going to be the greatest fathering year you've ever had. This is going to be great. Yeah, I'm going to make mistakes. I don't even think they want to talk to me anymore. You fix that. We'll do it together. You see, he is such a good, good father that he never leaves you nor forsake you, never abandons you. He loves you so much. But if you're here this morning and you're a father, this is the goals to shoot for. And re let me just say this. It doesn't matter how old your children are. It doesn't matter even if you have children. Maybe you have adopted children. Maybe you have somebody that's not legally adopted, but God has brought them to your life and you're a parent to them. Uh, they're brought by God to you. And they need a father because they don't have one. And you're it. So let's bow our heads and pray this morning. Lord, we love you so much. Lord, we're so grateful that there is an absolute pattern of life to live that, that you have laid out in your word that will work. And so the instruction manual for each kid might not be in our hands, but here's what we do. We have enough instruction from your word that if we apply it to each unique child and we accept them for their differences, one's going to talk a lot, one's not going to talk very much. One's not going to talk at all. One of them's going to share their feelings too much and one of them's not going to share any of their feelings. And if we're not careful, we'll, we'll try to change all that. And we, we are to just embrace each child and their uniqueness and just work with that. Not try to make them be like their sister or their brother, but to love them just like they are, and they will have strength and weaknesses, and yeah, I got to get them to share some of their feelings, but I don't have to make them like everybody else, because we're all unique, and we pray, Lord, you teach us how to celebrate our uniqueness and everybody around us, and we pray that on this Father's Day, not only that you would help us to be a better father tomorrow, that we would be more and more grateful for the Father you've been to us. And so, church, if you would, just tell them thank you. Uh, we thank you, Father. I love you, and you've been a gracious, heavenly Father to me. You've forgiven me. You've worked within my weaknesses, and you've grown me up in some areas, and I still have areas that need work. But you, you're never going to stop loving me, and I'm so grateful uh, to you, Heavenly Father. And I thank you because you've been the perfect father to me. Help me to be that kind of father to those around me. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen.